Well, Noah, we've uh, watched six episodes so far of your first season of Fargo on FX, and uh, I must say, you had to be uh, a little bit crazy to even take this on because of the Coen Brothers movie. I'm sure friends and, and family and other co-workers said, you don't, don't attempt this, There's, it's a no-win situation. Uh, no one blatantly warned me against it, um, but I did have a moment of wondering if I was a little bit nuts for doing it, that's for sure. Um, you know, the, uh, the, they're big shoes to fill, but, uh, you know, what was fun was their movies are so inventive and iconoclastic that, you know, it really allowed me to do anything I wanted, you know, structurally. Um, and to play with tone and to, and to surprise people and um, so you know there was no downside to it uh, ultimately you know I was either going to succeed or fail in uh, living up to their name well and what I meant by that was no matter what if it was perfect if it was, if it was an A plus in your opinion people some people were never going to accept it some people were going to just check, always compare it to the movie sure you know there's always going to be the camp of how dare you or uh, uh, what gives you the right? But you know, luckily, I didn't. I haven't seen that much of that actually. I think there was a lot of reviews that started out saying, uh, when we first heard about it, we we couldn't understand why you would do that. But you know, I think by not actually remaking the movie, um, it people had to use their brains to figure out what we were actually doing and how it connected to the movie and how it was the same but different. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like with Allison's character, Molly, who is not Marge. Um, and, but I knew that if I introduced her as the chief of police in the town, people would compare her directly to Marge. So I created a male chief of police who, with a pregnant wife so that the audience would think, oh, I get it, they just reversed it. And uh, he's the chief and with the pregnant wife. And then I sort of snuck Molly in through the side as a sidekick character. And then, of course, when when Vern uh, uh, passes and Molly has to step forward, and we realize, oh wait, she is the center of the show. But you you didn't start out comparing her, so hopefully she gets a fair shake. Now the Cohen brothers are executive producers on this project. What kind of input have they had with you? Uh, you know, they haven't wanted much, really. Um, their involvement basically was putting their. They agreed to put their names on the show. Um, and to say, yes, we feel like this represents our work. Um, but um, they didn't, you know, they read the first script uh, and and decided from that that they wanted to be involved, and, and then the, we showed them the first episode. I'm not sure they've read another script. I'm not sure they've seen another episode. I, I uh, respect their wishes to be left to make their own work. Well, I think it was a smart choice not to go with any characters from the movie or any of the, you know, it's it's definitely its own thing, but you did uh, make sure that you, uh, there there have been certain touches, like you mentioned, with the wife, but uh, certainly the the uh, briefcase of money found out in the snow was a big, big uh, moment from the movie. Yeah, and that, you know, I liked sneaking that in in the fourth episode so that the audience could spend three episodes resigning themselves to the fact that this is completely different than the movie and then suddenly here's this di direct connection to the movie um, I think that you know that gave people a, the connection that they probably wanted instinctually um, but the show stood on its own two feet before that happened I want to talk about some of the actors you mentioned Allison so let's start with her this is a, a career changer for her. This is going to send her off in a in a big path for probably the rest of her career. How did and, and you've got a lot of well known people as well as, as as people we don't know as well. How did you come across her? Well, we wanted to cast it like a movie. It was it's a ten hour movie. We weren't asking these actors to do multiple seasons, and so we thought we could put together a, a pretty great cast for it, um, including actors like Billy Bob Thornton and Martin Freeman. And then, you know, we all agreed early on that, that Molly's character could be a discovery, that we didn't need to find a famous face to put in that role. From my position, it's almost better to have someone that, that the world doesn't know because then they've got nothing to project onto the actress. Um, and she put herself on tape in Chicago, uh, and that tape came across my desk, and I'd seen probably a hundred actresses at that point. Uh, 
walking into a, you know, an 85 degree uh, uh, casting room in in Santa Monica with parkas on, uh, and saying "cold enough for you, chief." Uh, and then I saw this tape um, of Allison, and she just she felt completely real. She got all the nuance of the comedy, but she wasn't doing a Saturday Night Live version. Um, and from the minute I saw it, it was my mission to get her cast in the role. And Billy Bob Thornton, I mean, it seems like a logical choice, but was it difficult to talk? I mean, he's got a lot of film stuff going. Was it difficult to talk him into doing a TV series? It was surprisingly not difficult to get to talk him into it. I mean, we offered him the role, and, and he read the material, and we met with him, and I'm pretty sure that he decided about... 20 pages in that he was going to do it and and you know I was prepared to walk him through okay well here's what the character does for the next you know nine episodes and he didn't really want to know you know he he liked the idea of discovering it as he went along um, and you know he's obviously worked with Joel and Ethan on 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 two movies and and you know he was very uh, complimentary about the the material, and he said, "Look, I never changed a word they wrote, and I wouldn't change a word of this." And uh, and he stuck to that, and you know, it was a great partner. You know, one of the genius casting moves to me is Martin Freeman because, and I even said this the, after watching that first episode on on one of our posts that I've never seen him in a role like this before, and I don't, I don't even how, know how you thought of him because you know, obviously not from America, he doesn't right. hasn't done this kind of thing before. What what made him the right choice from your mind? Well, you know, I, I've seen him, you know, in The Office and The Hobbit and Sherlock, and, and he always plays this really kind of buttoned-up guy, but there's always this element of... Um, he's always got this sort of energy under his the buttoned-upness where you always feel like he could snap at any minute. Um, and that was the energy that I wanted for the character, obviously. And as, you know, I, and I told, I told him you know, and his agent, you know, the, the journey that, that Lester Nygaard goes on in this show is the journey that I would think that you would want to go on as an actor, which is to show that you're not just that bottled up guy, but look what happens when the bottle gets opened and, and look how far you can go. And, and, you know, I think he really enjoyed that. He really liked the fact that he's not normally asked to do this level of, of material, this darkness. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, he, he's a great comedic actor, but I think he pro proved here that he's just a great actor, period. One thing I liked about this, this arc that we've seen him on, and we've only seen six episodes, but once everything start, bad started happening to him, at the very last moment of that sixth episode was the first time we've seen him uh, after he snuck out and comes back to the hospital. I mean, there's just this this moment yeah. of, of almost joy, like he got away with something and he enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, in the script I wrote, he, uh, you know, we have this moment and the camera's pushing in on him and he's sitting there and he gives this little smile and then I think I wrote, he's winning, you know, and and uh, I think that's the thing is for the first time, he's he basically has felt out of control for the first five hours as he's trying, as first he commits a murder and then he's desperately trying to get away with it both from the cops and from the the hitmen who come in from out of town and now finally at the sixth at the end of the sixth hour um, he's taken things into his own hands and he's turned the tables and you know he might actually be good at this being a, just a 10 episode uh, at least for this season what how freeing is that to you that you don't have to, you don't have to carry over any character if you don't want to uh, to another to another year yeah, well, it's great to tell a story with an end, you know, because knowing where the end is, um, you write to it, and you start writing to the end in the very first page, you know, you, you start writing to the end, um, and every step along the way is a concrete step toward your end game, um, and that's great because it allows you to make really decisive moves uh, every hour, and to say, this is the step that takes us from A to B and B to C, and you know eventually we're going to end up at Z. And and there's never a moment where you're you could okay we got to fill two episodes you know we got to vamp for a couple of episodes before we get to our end game. You know we we kind of arbitrarily settled on ten hours uh, with the network early on, some way to distinguish it from their 
normal 12 episode season um, but it ended up feeling like the perfect length because we were able to do some structural innovations um, and and you know really play with the form but we didn't have to kill a couple of episodes just to get where we were going and really you just want to ask the audience to take too much in, in. you know you, you only want a certain contained amount of story you need a certain number of moving pieces and if you get too many moving pieces, it's hard for the audience to keep them straight. Yeah, this seems to be somewhat of a trend now, especially, I think American Horror Story really kicked this back off, this anthology that used to be, you know, in the 50s, especially on TV, something real, and yeah. now now you can get big name people, uh, True Detective, your show, uh, Horror Story, uh, to do, uh, say, one season or 10 episodes or 12 or whatever that number is, that yeah. you might not could get to sign a five-year contract. Yeah, I think that's that's it. And I, but I think also from a writer's standpoint, it's you know, I don't necessarily want to do the same thing for ten years and tell the you know the stories about the same characters. I mean, there's a place in 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 you know the heart of Hollywood for shows like NCIS or or uh, CSI or those those shows that the juggernaut twenty two episode a year, ten, twelve, fifteen year runs, um, but I don't know. I mean, it's you, you. You end up repeating yourself. You have to, and and that was never interesting to me. But you know, when I started out and pitching this idea to them, I guess American Horror Story had just finished its first season, um, and uh, but you know, all the other ones, True Detective, and uh, they. I don't think they'd even been reported yet. It's but yeah. I, I mean, I think you know Ryan Murphy and and. And American Horror Story really opened a door to show that that was possible. I think we'll see more of it. Now, will you be back for another Fargo cycle with different different stories, different characters? Unclear at this point. Uh, you know, I certainly um, feel like I have another ten hour movie in me uh, in this uh, in this region. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it's a conversation that that we have to have with the network, and you know. These uh, the shows now the ratings. It's not as simple as how to do last night. It's you break it out over three days or seven days or you know it even has a secondary shelf life um, you know on demand and you know so it's there's more there's more of a long term see how the the ser series does approach. But I think everyone is really enjoying the fact that we made a ten hour movie and it's been so well received. Um, and we just want to let it be what it is for right now. If you did uh, work it out with them to come back and do a second cycle, do you feel like you would go the horror story route, which is some of the same actors but a whole different different, different scenario, or maybe what True Detective looks like they're going to do, which is all new cast, all new, you know, all new plot? Yeah, it seems like, I mean, I thought that that was a brilliant move on Ryan's part to, to have a troop of actors sort of tell the same different stories every year but you know it's it's such an iconic way to do it that that I don't really feel like I should copy that um, and you know I feel like once the second season that would get broken and we'd figure out what the roles were then then we would decide you know how to cast it but but you know I love the idea that you know we aren't requiring more than ten hours from uh, from these actors, and and who knows, the sky's the limit who we could get for the second season. Is my hope. Well, let's talk about awards for a moment. Um, that's what we do mainly on our website, and yeah. you're entered in. I'm sorry. No, I said okay, great. Okay, we uh, you're entered in the movie mini series categories, and uh, which is interesting to us this year, following everything because. That's where the horror story uh, projects always go. But True right. Detective decides to go into drama series. What's your feeling about you know these anthologies and how they should fall for Emmys? Well, it was very nice of, of True Detective to get out of my category. Uh, very helpful, I think. Hard to stop the McConaughey juggernaut. Um, and he did a great job, and Woody Harrelson did a great job, and I, I thought that, that was a, it was a beautiful film that they made. Um, you know, it's. I think it's interesting how you define. You know, it's like Shameless is suddenly a comedy, and and you know, there's a lot of jumping around into different categories based on trying to win the award or at least get nominated. Um, you know, I think we set out to make a miniseries, 
and that's what we did. And I'm, ha I'm I couldn't be happier that that's my category. Um, you know, I, I do end up uh, competing with uh, another show on on the same network, um, and uh, you know, I mean, I hope that uh, that they get a lot of nominations as well. Um, but you know, I, I I like the idea that in this day and age the length of the story dictates the length of the show as opposed to the length of the show dictating the length of the story. Yeah, I, I agree with where you placed your show. I'm not, I'm not real happy with True Detective going over into the drama series, mainly because you've got somebody like Matthew McConaughey or Woody Harrelson that come into a program, only have to do one year, and then they go compete against people that have signed you know, contracts, you know, Brian Cranston, John Hamm, whoever it might be, that have committed to playing a character for a long, long time. So it doesn't seem quite fair to me. Well, look, it's obviously these categories are, are uh, the definitions are a little hazy. Um, but, you know, when you call something a series, I guess, you know, the idea is that you're doing multiple seasons of it and, and that, um, you know, it's the same cast carrying over from year to year. Um, you know, I mean, I assume if True Detective comes back, then next time around they would want to be in the same drama category and none of the same actors would be, you know, would be in the show. So, I don't know. I mean, the rules are what they are and they allow the networks to do what they do. Um, you know, I just know that, that for me, um, you know, they seem like a... They seemed like a surefire winner in my category, so uh, you know, I, I like being the underdog. I don't mind being the underdog, but it's nice not to be in the, a shadow that big. Well, we a lot of us feel like you're going to do really, really well across the board. Um, I, I'm anxious to see what's going to happen with those nominations. Let me just ask you a couple of shooting questions. Obviously, you shoot this up in, uh, I believe, Canada. Is that correct? Yeah, in Calgary, which is in Alberta. Yeah. What uh, What kind of issues did that bring, just from a weather standpoint? Well, cold mostly. I mean, we had snow that we had to, uh, you know, we needed. Uh, we needed snow, and then at a certain point, we needed less snow because it, it was, you know, we had a, bl a blizzard um, at a certain point that was not helpful to us shooting wise. Um, it got down into the the negative 30s, down to minus 40 with the wind chill. We couldn't shoot that day. It was just too cold for human beings. Um, to be out and propane turns to a liquid at minus 40, so that's not helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that, that was mostly it, was, was uh, weather-related. But at the same time, you know, in the original movie, it was the warmest winter in, in the region's history, and, and they literally had to keep moving north. You know, that scene where Molly is investigating the overturned car... I think they shot that over the course of three days, and every day they had to pack the car up and move it to another field north. If you look back, you'll realize it's not the same. It's not the same field two days in a row. So, okay. Um, so they were chasing the snow, and you know that was always the roll of the dice. We had to start in early November, and and we didn't know was there going to be snow or no snow, and what would we do if there wasn't? But thankfully, it snowed. And another question about, uh, you write all the scripts, and, and uh, I asked Colin Hanks this last week. I would love your take on it. One thing I like about the show so much is you're not afraid of silences between characters. You're not afraid to let a, a scene um, develop itself out with, you know, without having to be action-packed or having to be tons of dialogue. What do you feel about silences uh, being part of the dialogue? I think it's, you know, there's a rhythm to it and a music to it that, you know, that's really helpful, and I think that, you know, television was always a medium of, of talking heads, and then, you know, and then over the last, you know, since The Sopranos, really, it's become increasingly cinematic, um, and, and Breaking Bad especially was a show where if you read those scripts, they'll have four or five pages with no dialogue where it's, where the story is being told with the camera, and that was a real goal of mine was, you know, I'm not only, you know, uh, following in the footsteps of, of two of the best dialogue writers in the business, but two of the best filmmakers in the business. And so much of what they do is about building suspense and, and building drama through, through those silences, you know, both for comedic purposes and dramatic purposes. And, and so that was really great for me and great when the network president, um, John Langraff, told me that 
uh, after he, he saw the first cut and he said, I'm not worried people are going to turn the channel because it's too slow. And the minute he said that to me, I just made my show. Well, we're enjoying it so much. I wish I had already seen the last four. You, you know a lot more than we do right at this moment. So somebody watching this interview you know, over the middle of June, I'm yeah. sorry we couldn't talk about the end of the show. Oh, so good. But, you know, maybe we'll come back and we'll talk about it then. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, after after uh, nominations are out on July 10th, you got to come back. We'll talk about those. We'll talk about the uh, the last four episodes of the the uh, season, and hopefully you'll have some good news about a season two renewal at that point. I hope so. Thank you. Well, so thank much. you very much. Have a great uh, rest of the week. Thanks. Bye.